Thank you very much for attending Lyme and Other Tick-Borne Diseases, an overview of ticks and tick-borne diseases in the U.S. and New Jersey. And my name is Pat Smith. I'm president of the Lyme Disease Association, Inc., and a 39-year Lyme advocate and educator. A little bit about the LDA. We're volunteer-run, 32-plus years of service, and 95% of our monies go directly to our programs. We've awarded 123 research grants, and 62 journal publications have resulted from that funding. We've awarded 167 educational grants to organizations. We've established Lyme Aid for Kids, which provides medical help for families who have children who need to be diagnosed and or begin treatment. We've awarded $450,000 to date. We presented 22 continuing medical education Lyme and tick-borne disease conferences for physicians and researchers partnering with Columbia University as recently as October. We are a member of Candid GuideStar. We've earned the highest level of uh, transparency, which is platinum. We belong to the combined federal campaign for 18 years. That's a federal workplace giving. And we partner with dozens of U.S. Lyme organizations under the LDA net umbrella. We also partner with the Environmental Protection Agency PESP program, which means basically getting rid of ticks. And as LDA president, I've testified before two different U.S. House committees on Lyme disease in D.C. And I've been invited to the CDC Vector Borne Diseases Branch in Fort Collins, Colorado twice, and also to CDC Atlanta for their Lyme in the South workshop, which I co-chair to section. Our website has free doctor referral and also brochure ordering online for shipping and handling only. And we have a YouTube channel, Facebook, and social media. We had over 17 speakers from across the U.S. So Lyme disease is found in more than 80 countries worldwide. And uh, this is maps that we produce and everyone's free to copy them and use them or print them up big in, for your classrooms or whatever else. So 1990, there were 7,943 reported cases to CDC. In 2020, there were 18,000 cases reported to CDC. And from 1990 through 2020, there were over 734,000 uh, cases that were reported total. Now, <clears throat> these maps, you can go on and you they're interactive. You could click, for example, the state of New Jersey, and you will see that chart that shows the total cases that are reported each year from 1990 through 2020. Now, this is the ranking by state using CDC reported numbers. And you can see in 2021 that New Jersey ranks first. And it was 3,518 cases, but CDC indicates that it's underreported by a factor of 10. So that means, of course, 35,180 cases probably occurred during that time period. <clears throat> Now, this is a chart that the LDA did up showing you the data uh, by age from 2001 through 17. Children 0 to 19 represented 29% of case numbers. And the born and unborn are affected by Lyme in humans, meaning pregnant women can transmit Lyme to the fetus through the placental, for transplacental transmission. And it can cause death of the fetus and perhaps birth defects. Now, this is a Fair Health Study infographic, which is interesting with case numbers because the case numbers are very low. Uh, from the reported case numbers. And this shows from 
2007 to 2021, in rural areas, the case numbers increased 357%, in urban areas, 65%. Um, and this is due to private uh, insurer claims. And by the way, before I forget, the CDC has announced in the last couple of years that due to private insurance claims that there are now 476,000 cases of people getting diagnosed and treated annually in the United States. So you can see the big difference between reported numbers and what is actuality happening. Now, what about dogs, cats, and Lyme? And I bring this up, it's significant because pet owners tend to be at a highest risk. So dogs act as, as sentinels. They're often diagnosed with Lyme before people, 50% more likely. They tend to roll in the leaves, run unchecked into tick habitats, and they can bring unattached ticks into the home. And dogs and cats can get ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis. And so uh, dogs uh, in a study had 43% a greater risk of developing kidney de disease when Borrelia, which is the uh, organism that causes Lyme, antibodies were present. They had a 300% greater risk of developing it when Ehrlichia antibodies were present. So we know that these diseases affect dogs and many of them die from kidney disease. So what about canine disease in New Jersey? According to the Companion Animal Parasite Council, uh, this was in 2022. And Lyme disease uh, had then 18,355 positive cases in dogs. And the dogs, dogs were tested. One out of 20 dogs in New Jersey tested positive for Lyme, one out of 15 for anaplasmosis, one out of 30 for ehrlichiosis. And you can all find that uh, on the website if you're interested. So what are the significant players in Lyme disease? People always think about the deer. Well, actually it's the reservoir hosts. In our area of the country, the white-footed mouse, the vole, the chipmunk, the eastern gray squirrel, the shrew, other small mammals, and a, a whole bunch of different kinds of birds. So what does the deer do? Well, basically, when I speak in the schools, I tell the kids it's transport and a meal because the ticks will get on the deer. Oftentimes, they mate on the deer and fall off, and the deer transports it while it's on all over the place. Um, and uh, of course, the vector is the tick itself. So how do ticks get on us? Well, the hard-bodied ticks, and that's just about all we'll be talking about today, um, the deer and the American dog tick, they climb small plants and grass. That's called questing. And when animals brush against that, the ticks latch on. And the deer and the American dog ticks are passive feeders. That means they kind of hang around and wait for you or your kids or your animals. Now, the lone star tick uh, is actually an active feeder, and that will actually run after you. And the people in the field tell me when they're collecting ticks, it's really kind of scary because those things can motor right on up without them realizing it. So if you have contact with leaves or ground cover, the ticks can climb up on you. And pets, of course, carry them to people. Now, there is a soft-bodied tick, um, and I will mention that only in connection with a particular disease later on. Whoops, sorry about that. So how a tick feeds, this is one of the most important things I think I'm going to tell you because it explains uh, a lot of things. So it secretes something to numb you. Then it cuts you open. Then it sticks hollow straw-like barbed hypostome in you. And it secretes a glue-like substance into you to cement itself to you. Then it sucks your blood. And some ticks actually secrete blood thinners 
and immune regulators. So they're controlling you basically. So during feeding, the organisms in the tick flow inside you. So this is proper tick removal. Please do not believe anything you read on the internet about putting soap or putting a match or anything like that on a tick. Don't, do not put anything on a tick when it's on you and you want to remove it. Don't burn the tick. Don't touch the tick with your fingers. And do not squeeze the tick body. Do use pointed tweezers close to the skin on the head of the tick or you can get a special tick removal tool, but pull the tick straight out. Do not twist or squeeze. The reason for this, it can inject anything it has into you and that greatly increases your risk of infection. So do clean the skin area with antiseptic and you can save the tick for testing at testing labs or for your physician. Most of them preferably prefer, uh, prefer uh, live in a Ziploc bag with a moist, moist cotton ball. Um, and you can, uh, for testing labs, you can call your health department or we have some listed on our website. Do call your doctor. And if you want to dispose of the tick, the best and permanent way is to put it in tape. Can't get out of that. So what about tick attachment time? I'm sure you've all heard about, well, it's 24 hours, it's, it's 72 hours, it's, you know, 10 minutes, what is it? So the, the, the concrete thing is the longer a tick attachment, the greater the risk of infection. So why days of attachment used as necessary for transmission? Why do they say this? Generally, the Lyme bacteria is in the tick midgut. That's kind of like our stomach. So some say it takes a 24 to 48 hours to migrate to the salivary glands of the tick. So that's why some will say 24 to 48 hours tick attachment is necessary. This is not always true. And there is research. I did provide some, but there is research out there that sometimes the bacteria is already systemic in the tick and in the salivary glands at the time of attachment. And so it could occur within 24 hours or less uh, under some unusual circumstances. So that cannot be discounted, that it can be less than that time period. Now, other tick-borne diseases can be transmitted in a very short time time period. For example, Powassan virus carried by the same tick, very high fatality rate. We're going to talk about that. So this is a map showing you with a black-legged deer tick, that's Exodi scapularis. That's the one that affects us probably the most. And this is a picture of deer ticks and poppy seeds. And you've all heard that poppy seed size nymph deer ticks transmit the most disease. That is true in the East. Uh, and you'll see there's the female, the larger one, the male, and then the nymphs. And there they are. The poppy seeds under the microscope are white. And you can see the size. Now, this is a deer tick laying eggs, ovipositing. They lay thousands of eggs. And this is the stages. There's the female, the male, and there's the the uh, the larva is the one you haven't seen. That's that white uh, one that almost looks like the eggs. And then there's the nymph next to that and the eggs. And off to the right, I guess you, can you see that cursor? Lisa? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, the, sorry, that is the female uh, that is engorged and laying those eggs. Now, this again is the deer chick, and it transmits or can the following diseases. Two types of Lyme, I'm going to talk about those. Borrelia myomotoi, which is Lyme-like, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, bartonellosis or lichiosis, Powassan virus, and tick paralysis, which is actually a toxin. Now, this is the American dog tick on the end of a paper clip. You can see the big 
uh, female there. And then there's the male, female, and the uh, stage of the smaller stage of the deer to, yeah, I'm sorry, the nymph stage of the deer tick inside that paper clip. So it gives you an idea of their size. So the American dog tick, and then uh, that map shows you that's uh, CDC surveillance, tick surveillance. Uh, that means they discovered established populations of these ticks in those areas. Um, and so you can see that New Jersey is totally inundated. Now it transmits Rocky Mountain spotted fever, tularemia, and it can transmit tick paralysis. Not a lot of people know about this. Tick paralysis is thought to be caught by, by a toxin in saliva of an attached tick. People with tick paralysis can experience weakness or paralysis that gradually moves up the body. And these symptoms you get can often resemble other neurologic conditions, Guillain-Barre, botulism, and patients typically regain movement within 24 hours of removing the tick. But the only cure for this is you have to remove the tick. So if you don't know you have a tick on you and this is happening, very problematic. Okay, this is the American dog tick. It lays 4,000 to 6,000 eggs. Very exciting tick there. Uh, and sometimes these larvae of this tick hatch infected with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. That means that the larvae that you see here, which are very, very small, can bite you and give you Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Now the deer tick mostly does not hatch uh, with Lyme disease. So usually you don't have to worry with that. Now this is the brown dog tick. Up to about five years ago, I didn't bring it into the presentation, but now it needs to be because even though the government told us, you don't have to worry about them. They only bite dogs. They don't do anything for humans. Well, guess what? Over the last several years, what the government has found that the dog tick is transmitting Rocky Mountain spotted fever to humans down in the Southwest in particular on the tribal lands. And so this is problematic. They mainly bite dogs, they can bite humans. These ticks are the only ones that I know about in our US that can infest homes. They also infest dog kennels. Other ticks cannot survive generally in homes because the, the conditions are not good for them. But this one can live its entire life cycle in a house. So this is the Lone Star Tick. This one in New Jersey, uh, when I first started out, um, it was new to New Jersey, and now it isn't. It's uh, very prevalent. Now, new, this tick can transmit alpha-gal meat allergy. If you haven't heard about it, you will tonight. Star Eye, also known as Master's Disease, Tularemia, Heartland Virus, Tick Paralysis, I mentioned that, Q fever, ehrlichiosis, and bourbon virus. These are all tick-borne diseases, and you can see the map where the Lone Star tick is situated. Um, now, as far as Rocky Mountain spotted fever, I mentioned that with an asterisk. It can carry the organism, but it's still in discussion if it can transmit Rocky Mountain spotted fever. There's been one case documented, but the government doesn't want to say that it does. So the Lone Star Tick is very uh, active in transmitting some of these new viral tick-borne diseases and conditions. So one is the Heartland Virus, and uh, this is the area, you can see the map, the blue on the map, where the Heartland currently exists, and uh, that you can get testing done at the CDC. The only treatment is supportive treatment. That's it, folks. There is no other. Um, I want to go down to the bourbon virus. And no, it's not named after the uh, after dinner drink or whatever. Um, it is named after a county in Kansas. Uh, and there is molecular and serologic testing available at the CDC. And again, only supportive therapy. 
As of 2017, there were 50 cases reported. There's the three uh, states and deaths were, deaths were reported from, I, I know from Bourbon and I think Heartland might have had some. Now with AlphaGal, that is something that uh, physicians have been looking at and researchers probably for the past five, six, or maybe seven years or so. Um, and basically, uh, we'll talk about that a little more. Now, the Gulf Coast tick. Well, guess what? Supposedly, we didn't have to worry about the Gulf Coast tick. If you look at the map that shows there from the government, it uh, doesn't hit New Jersey. But as of uh, 2022, there is now an established population in, in Salem County, New Jersey, of the Gulf Coast tick. And Rutgers is looking for residents to send any of their ticks there so they can see if any of them are Gulf Coast. They're trying to see how far they've established. So this transmits something called Rickettsia parkeri rickettsiosis. And it's these are these diseases with rickettsiosis are some of them are very similar to Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So the Rocky Mountain wood tick. We don't generally have to worry about that unless someone brings one home on their, their uh, trips, but it transmits Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Colorado tick fever, tick paralysis, Q fever, and tularemia. Now the far west and west coast ticks, the western black-legged tick, that's like our deer tick. Ours is called Exodes scapularis, theirs is called Exodes pacificus. And the Western black legged transmits Lyme and all those other diseases on the list. And the Pacific Coast uh, tick transmits those diseases. And they're found in various areas uh, across California. Now, this is really important because this is relatively new. And that's why I put it at the end of the tick discussion. Longhorn tick. Hemophysalis longicornis, and it came to New Jersey in 2017. It was discovered here uh, on a, a farm on a sheep in New Jersey. And they found a large infestation in multiple life stages. The, the sheep hadn't been, and no travel history, I guess it hadn't taken a jet any place, but it was infested. It was treated with permethrin, and they waited to see if the ticks died over the winter. Unfortunately, the ticks did not die over the winter. So anyway, the bottom line, when they collected these ticks, they collected over a thousand here and they only found one male. And the reason is this is an invasive population that came here from Asia. And generally, these kinds of populations are exclusively parthenogenetic. They can reproduce without a male. So from 2017 to 2022, it's now been confirmed in 18 states. So the longhorn tick now has been known to kill cows in a number of states by exsanguination. They bleed to death. Thousands of ticks are found on each cow. Um, and so... Uh, it's been known to transmit several human diseases, including the spotted fever rickettsioses in the East Asian countries where it came from. But so far, our government hasn't reported any disease cases in the U.S. to date. And again, the big factor is doesn't require a male. These populations can pop right up. I have seen the, the case of a truck that pulled in somewhere, and I mean a real pickup truck, and the, the men, workmen got out and they came back a few hours later. The, tick, the, the truck was covered from top to bottom with these ticks. I have to tell you, I've been involved 39 years. I've not ever seen anything like that and don't want to. So what are the four medically important ticks in New Jersey? And what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that you can't, we don't have some of the others. These are the ones that do the most damage. This came from New Jersey Department of Health, the American dog tick, uh, there it is, and the Lone Star tick, and, the, and of course our famous black-legged tick, and there's the brown dog tick. 
So this is a indication uh, of what's happening close by Pike County, Pennsylvania, which borders New Jersey. And we did gave them a grant to look at uh, and and uh, study for pathogens. They tested their ticks, their deer ticks for the Lyme bacteria and Bartonella. Thirty nine percent by PCR were positive for Borrelia and Bartonella eighteen point five percent. So now I'm going to talk about Lyme disease that you know, and you'll see what I mean by that in a little bit. So that's transmitted by the black-legged tick and the western black-legged out west, caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, and there's an early flu-like illness, muscular aches and pains, joint pain and or swelling, fatigue, malaise, fever, and headache. Now, possible rash, not everyone folks get a rash. This is very important. And the actual classic bullseye usually only occurs 9%. And it's a subset of what we call the uh, erythema migrans rash, which 60 to 80% of patients develop. I think that's high, but that's what uh, some of the studies have shown. Um, later symptoms, it can attack all systems in the body. Now, there are various tests, including the two-tier, ELISA or if equivocal, followed by the Western blot, and the typical first line of defense is doxycycline. Now, here's a picture of some Lyme rashes. Some are the classic bullseye that usually indicates that it has a central clearing, and some are not. Not everybody gets one again, can look different than the classic bullseye, and can be on other places on your body than the bite site. That's in disseminated disease. Now, this is a rash poster that we funded Columbia to do, and it's on our website, their website. You're, you're free to download it <clears throat> and use it if you need be. So what are other Lyme symptoms and signs? And by the way, this cardiac poster can be downloaded from our website. Musculoskeletal, joint pain, swelling, stiffness, muscle pain, migrating pain, uh, cramps, shin splints, neck or back stiffness, joint pain and or swelling or cramps that may migrate. That's usually significant. Uh, TMJ, neck creaks and cracks, tender soles, believe it or not, of your feet. Reproductive, testicular pain, pelvic pain, menstrual irregularity, unexplained milk production, sexual dysfunction or loss of libido. Now, cardiac and pulmonary, very important. Chest pain or rib soreness, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, pulse skips, heart block, heart murmur, valve prolapse. Num Slide number three, neurological, muscle twisting, headache, tingling, numbness, burning or stabbing sensation, facial paralysis, which looks like Bell's palsy, dizziness, poor balance, increased motion sickness, lightheadedness, wooziness, difficulty walking, tremor, confusion, difficulty thinking, concentrating, reading, forgetfulness, poor short-term memory, disorientation, getting lost, going to wrong place. Now, I'm not talking about not using your GPS. I'm talking about people, professional people whom I know, uh, have gone to work and have come out, didn't know where they parked, didn't even know what car was theirs, uh, and didn't know how to get home. Difficulty with speech, double or blurry vision, eye pain, blindness, increased floaters, increased sensitivity to light or sound or smell, buzzing or ringing in ears, ear pain, decreased hearing or deafness, seizure activity, white matter lesions, and low blood pressure. These are all, by the way, all uh, scientifically shown to happen. Uh, neuropsychiatric, mood swings, irritability, depression, disturbed sleep, uh, personality changes, OCD, violent outbursts, anorexia, paranoia, panic, anxiety attacks, hallucinations, visual, auditory, sensory. My daughter, when she was at some of her worst with her chronic Lyme, uh, when she was young, um, and she had all of those. Uh, and additionally, for three years straight, 
She was in temporal lobe seizures for 16 hours uh, or more each day, six out of seven days every week. She was out of school for uh, four full years and two partial years. Gastrointestinal, nausea or vomiting, loss of appetite, GERD, change in bowel function, constipation, diarrhea, gastritis, abnormal cramping, cystitis, irritable bowel or bladder, newly diagnosed IBS, other, fever, sweats or chills, weight change, uh, fatigue, tiredness, hair loss, swollen glands, sore throat, difficulty swallowing, swelling around the eyes, and swelling of the feet. Now, you can certainly understand why it is extremely difficult to diagnose folks, especially when we don't have a gold standard test, which I will talk about in a bit. So Lyme disease you may not know. Borrelia maonii, this was just discover, discovered uh, in, I think, 2016. Uh, right now, it's mostly in the Midwest um, and hasn't been detected in, in 25,000 blood samples from other part of the U.S. Um, and it's, it's similar to Borrelia burgdorferi. It's transmitted by the black-legged ticks. Um, and the symptoms are similar, early symptoms, fever, headaches, rash, neck pain, later stages, arthritis, differences, some differences from Borrelia burgdorferi symptoms may include nausea and vomiting, more diffuse rashes, higher concentration of bacteria in the blood, 180 fold higher than, than Borrelia burgdorferi. Borrelia burgdorferi does not remain in your blood very long, and it's only in small quantities. So anyway, uh, that's pretty much all you need to know about that for the moment. Co-infections. So one tick bite can cause one disease. So what about deer ticks? What can they carry and transmit? Borrelia burgdorferi or maonii, Babesia anaplasma, Ehrlichia, Bartonella, Borrelia maomotoi, Hawassian virus, tick paralysis toxin. And uh, remember that other tick-borne diseases may have similar symptoms as Lyme disease, but they may have different treatments. So what about anaplasmosis and ehrlichiosis? These are two that are found quite a bit in our region. Anaplasmosis, formerly called HGE, it's transmitted by Scapularis and Pacificus, again, the deer tick and the out west deer tick, if you will, and uh, generally begins within a week of a tick bite, the onset of symptoms. Uh, fever, severe headache, malaise, muscle pain, chills, nausea, vomiting. If treatment is delayed or other medical conditions are present, this can cause very severe illness. And there's a big age risk factor. And signs and symptoms of severe or late stage, respiratory, bleeding, organ failure, and death. So there are tests, blood smears, if uh, IgG, maybe IgM, uh, all kinds of other, and a PCR. Um, and treatment is generally doxycycline. Now, in rare cases, it can be spread by blood transfusion. Now, ehrlichiosis can be caused by several different strains of the bacteria by different ticks. Um, there are smears and tests and uh, treatment, uh, which is usually, again, doxy. And the uh, symptoms tend to be fever, chills, headache, muscle aches, and sometimes upset stomach. And it can, or lichia, be spread through blood transfusion and organ transplant in rare cases. So again, you're hearing that a lot of these symptoms for tick-borne diseases are similar or the same. Very, very difficult, folks. So babesiosis, this is one of the most common co-infections with Lyme. It's a parasite. It can be transmitted through the blood supply. And uh, finally, the FDA in 2018 and 19 approved testing of the blood supply for at least several of the strains of, of this babesiosis. In rare cases, there can be congenital transmission. 
and there are diagnoses uh, microscopically, blood smears, so on. And it can be fatal to elderly or those with no spleen. Now, a lot if it's here with a Lyme co-infection, it can have more serious symptoms. So the symptoms, fever, chills, fatigue, headache, muscle pain, sweats, anemia, lots of times babesiosis, classic, has tremendous sweats. Uh, my daughter said she thought she was going through the change because her sweats were so severe at the age of 15. Uh, but this is what happens. Now, this, uh, this little map in the corner just shows you from 06 through 13, uh, the cases reported from all states and Washington, D.C., from the FDA. Um, and it's, believe me, it's a lot up higher now. So Borrelia meiomotoi disease. This is caused by a spirochete-shaped bacteria. Now, the Lyme disease bacteria is a spirochete. If you remember that, uh, and I'm sure you know, syphilis is a spirochete. Okay, well, this is a spirochete-shaped bacteria that's closely related to a relapsing fever group, and it's more distantly related to the bacteria causing Lyme disease. It's translated, uh, transmitted again by the black-legged tick and in the West Coast, uh, the Western black-legged. Symptoms, now here the big thing with this, fever, which may be recurring, it comes and it goes. Headaches, chills, body and joint pain, fatigue, arthralgia, myalgia, uncommon, dizziness, confusion, vertigo, dyspnea, nausea, abdominal pain, diarrhea, anorexia. Um, <clears throat> what, what, what happens sometimes is you have uh, three days and uh, they're separated by, you have three days of fever and it's separated by a febrile periods of seven days duration. That's why it's a relapsing fever. There are tests for it. The treatment is often doxycycline, though they can use zithro and ceftriaxone, and it is susceptible to other uh, drugs. <clears throat> this is the uh, Borrelia Miyamoto OI uh, map for 2013 to 2021. And you can see there were some cases uh, up in northern New Jersey and a little bit in southern New Jersey that were known, of course. Now, Powassan and virus, this is very important because this is something that is life-threatening. It's caused by the bite of ticks primarily found in the eastern U.S., uh, the black-legged deer tick, other ticks that the groundhog tick, tick, which rarely bites humans, squirrel tick rarely bites humans, and rarely through blood transfusions. The transmission time of the virus can be as soon as 15 minutes after a tick attachment. Now, the incubation period can be one to four weeks after a bite. Initially, headache, fever, nausea, vomiting, generalized weakness. It can progress to encephalitis, meningoencephalitis, or aseptic meningitis. And the symptoms of encephalitis may include altered mental status, seizures, speech problems, paresis or paralysis, movement disorders, and cranial nerve palsies. And encephalitis and meningitis, in those cases, death rates can be 10% of the neuroinvasive Powassan virus. 50% of the survivors have long-lasting neurologic deficits, headaches, muscle weaknesses, focal paralysis, and cognitive dif difficulties. Treatment. Unfortunately, only supportive treatment is available. It's a severe disease, often has hospitalized. Um, there are different tests uh, and um, you know, for the disease, and your, your physician should definitely be uh, on this. Uh, it is nationally notified. And the CDC recommends all health departments use the National Surveillance Case Definition, 
which is in red here. And if you go back and relook at this, you will be able to see what that is. Powassan viral disease, here's the reported cases, 2004 to 2022. And you can see that New Jersey is in the uh, greater than 10 cases. Now, there are more cases now happening than there were, but again, these cases are very serious. Now, what about Bartonellosis? This is interesting. This is a bacteria which can be found in fleas, lice, sand fleas, uh, and can be gotten through cat scratches and bites, cat saliva, broken skin, or mucosal sur surfaces. And it can be car can and is often carried by Ixodi scapularis, the deer tick. However, the CDC questions transmission by ticks. Its position is ticks may carry some species of Bartonella, but there is currently no causal evidence that ticks can transmit Bartonella infection to people through their bites. Well, I do have to say there was a, uh, a one case, I believe, that has been uh, shown, um, but CDC is not willing to, to admit to that at this point in time, but our physicians who treat Lyme often see cases of Bartonella with Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. And interestingly enough, but you might know a disease caused by Bartonella as cat scratch fever. Um, and that, of course, is done when cat scratches or bites someone's and, and transmit it. But of course, uh, this is different if it's tick-borne. And again, many researchers and others, doctors believe it, it definitely is. And when pre present in combination with Lyme, atypical presentations may result, including visual problems, headaches, significant lymph node enlargement, resistant neurologic deficits, and new onset seizure disorders. There are tests um, and there are treatments. Um, and so, uh, but it needs to get diagnosed and oftentimes doctors are not looking for it along with tick-borne diseases. Pat, can I just hop on and say that, um, although it says that the CDC doesn't recognize that, that I mm -hmm. was diagnosed with both Lyme and Bartonella. So it's, it's a real thing. Oh, it's decidedly many people are, there are many cases and the CDC does not deny cases. They just I indicate that they don't feel at this point there's enough evidence. But the, some of the premier researchers on Bartonella in the world definitely feel it is. Um, so Southern Chick Associated Rash Illness, better known as Star Eye, is transmitted by the bite of the Lone Star Chick that they're crawling all over New Jersey, as you know by now. And uh, this has also been called Master's Disease. Its infectious cause is unknown. They formerly thought Borrelia Lone Star Eye caused it, but then they nixed that. They, all these years, they still have no idea what organism causes this. Looks and acts like Lyme. You can get an EM-like rash, red expanding bullseye lesion at the bite. It appears within seven to 10 days, expands to a diameter of three inches or more. You may get fatigue, headache, fever, muscle and joint pains. At this time, I wanna speak a little bit about alpha-gal syndrome, which is a rapidly growing problem in tick-borne diseases. It's transmitted in the U.S. by the Lone Star Tick, Amblyona americanum, and it may be transmitted by other ticks. The CDC in 2010 through 2022 indicated 110,000 suspected U.S. cases were identified. And here you have a self-reported Z-map uh, showing alpha-gal syndrome condition found uh, around the world. So what is alpha-gal syndrome? Alpha-gal is sugar found in meat from mammals, such as pork, beef, rabbit, lamb, venison, etc. Sugar found in products made from mammals, gelatin, cow's milk, milk products, and some pharmaceuticals. It's not found in fish and seafood or reptiles, birds, eggs, or fruits and vegetables. 
Now, some people are allergic after consuming food or products containing alpha-gal. And alpha-gal is also known as red meat allergy or chick bite meat allergy. The symptoms are wide-ranging, including hives or itchy rash, nausea or vomiting, heartburn or indigestion, diarrhea, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, drop in blood pressure, swelling of the lips, throat, tongue, or eyelids, dizziness or faintness, or severe stomach pain. Commonly occurs these symptoms two to six hours after eating food or exposure to products containing the alpha-gal. For example, gelatin-coated medications. Now, anaphylaxis, which is potentially life-threatening, can occur. So the diagnosis is a clinician exam and positive diagnostic test. Now, many physicians are unaware of this condition. See your physician or your allergist if you feel that you might be experiencing this. The condition can last a lifetime. They're really not sure at this point. Tests specific for antibodies to alpha-gal or allergy skin tests may also be recommended to diagnose. And new tick bites may reactivate, reactivate aller, allergic reactions to alpha-gal. Doxycycline, but it's unknown whether this medication speeds recovery. So Q fever, another interesting one, because early on and for many years, CDC and the government has said it was it's tick transmitted. And now in recent times, the CDC doesn't indicate it's a tick-borne disease on its tick-borne disease website. However, if you go on its public health imaging website under Dermacenter marginatus, which is a sheep tick, it says that's a known vector of Q fever. So who knows? But anyway, it's a very serious disease. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, um, but it's uh, something that also has been previously weaponized for use in biological warfare, and it's considered a potential terrorist threat. You can get high fever, severe headache, malaise, myalgia, chills and or sweats, cough, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and chest pain. It may include endocarditis, encephalitis, pneumonia, hepatitis, and splenomegalia. So Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Now this is something very concerning because it has a relatively high death rate, though it has gone down a lot in recent times due to understanding it more and testing and looking for it more. It's transmitted by the American dog, the wood tick, the brown dog tick. There's increased New Southwest cases. I mentioned that to you from the brown dog tick. They are now transmitting it to humans in the Southwest. Um, now, the Lone Star tick can carry Rocky Mountain spotted fever organism, but transmission is unsettled. It doesn't say that the Lone Star transmits this. It's caused by Rickettsia rickettsii bacteria. The symptoms include fever, headache, myalgia, characteristic rash, and you can see the picture, the, the very fine rash all, all over here. In, uh, but that happens in most cases, but it may be absent in early disease. Um, and the treatment, again, is generally doxy. It, according to the CDC, there's a 5 to 10% mortality in clinical reviews. Now, in one of the Lancet publications in 2007, they indicated a 20% mortality rate. Um, in, uh, I was on the HHS Tick-Borne Disease Working Group in Washington. We presented our 2020 report, and we recommended improved provider recognition and empiric treatment of the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever rickettsiosis at early stages of illness prior to the onset of rash using doxy. And by the way, the CDC, now everyone says that children younger than eight can use doxy. 
Now, tularemia is transmitted by the bite of a tick or a deer fly. Uh, the ticks that transmit include humans, uh, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> that two humans include the American dog tick, Rocky Mountain wood tick, Lone Star tick. Uh, <clears throat> it's not transmitted by ticks that transmit Borrelia burgdorferi, like the black tick legged. Two types of ticks, tick-borne uh, infectious cause is Francisella tularensis. Um, there's other types of tularemia. There's tests. Uh, there are treatments, antibiotics. And the CDC notes people could be exposed as a result of bioterrorism. There's the tularemia map. And you can see 11 through 19 uh, New Jersey had 17 cases, uh, not a lot of cases, though. Uh, I don't know what the new ones are at the moment, uh, new numbers. Um, and this is uh, the reported cases for 2020, which is a little better. And there were some in uh, northern New Jersey there. So tick-borne relapsing fever, this is caused by that soft tick that I mentioned early on, soft bodies. These ticks, folks, can live for about 10 years, and they feed all the, they feed very shortly, and they can get off and on. They're, they're mostly found out in the far west, but if you do go out there and you, like, camp, you go into cabins and stay because maybe you tend to hunt or you fish or you have some kind of family vacation, these things can be in those old cabins, um, and they come out at night. That is it. It's called the Ornithodorus tick. Uh, it hides in animal burrows, um, usually at high attitudes, short feeds, um, and the female passes Borrelia to its eggs. So even the tiny ones can bite you and transmit it. Now, the Pacific Coast tick fever and heartland virus and bur bourbon virus. Pacific Coast fever, I'm not going to dwell on it, but it's something on the West Coast, uh, and it's transmitted by the Pacific Coast tick. And again, it's caused by a rickettsia species. Um, and heartland virus, I mentioned that. These things are nasty because they have no treatments um, and they're transmitted by the bite of infected tick. They think it's the lone star on the heartland um, and uh, testing, last I knew, could be formed at CDC only. They may have updated that. I don't know. Um, and the healthcare providers should contact their state health department. We, supportive care only deaths have resulted. The bourbon virus, again, thought to be the Lone Star tick, and uh, there is testing and treatment, and uh, which are available. The tests are at, at CDC, last I knew. So Q fever, I already mentioned that. I'm really not going to get into that. Uh, so some publications that are new since 2022 in tick-borne diseases that you might not hear about that are interesting. Dr. Richard Horowitz, a premier physician in Lyme disease, uh, did a study of 25 patients diagnosed with Borreliosis, Babesiosis, Bartonellosis. They received a double dose of Dapsone combination therapy, followed by courses of high-dose Dapsone combination. All 25 patients showed improvement in tick-borne disease symptoms. And in Northeastern Global News, published research by Kim Lewis, uh, a director of Northeastern's Antimicrobial Discovery Center, and he's studying antibiotic hygromycin, which is an old antibiotic, which targets and selectively kills Lyme, causing bacteria without damaging other beneficial bacteria in the gut microbiome. And the trials may begin as early as next year. Uh, a retrospective study at the Mayo 2013 through 22 uh, it's of the probable and confirmed neuroinvasive Powassan virus. Uh, 16 cases were identified 18 days between symptom onset and diagnosis, death in three patients within 90 days, and residual neurologic deficits in eight of the survivors. The data shows high mortality and morbidity rates. Interesting, uh, 
the uh, targeted PCR and sequencing confirmed the presence of Borrelia guarinii, another species that produces Lyme in Europe, in a Spitsbergen tick, demonstrating the presence of Lyme bacteria in high Arctic for the first time. Together, results contradict the notion that the Exodes urii tick, which is there, expanded there, but it's probably been there for some time, maintaining a relatively high population sizes and endemic transmission cycle of Borrelia burgdorferi, sensu lato. Really scary folks. So Lyme disease controversy, what's this about? The controversy simplified is whether after treatment, Lyme patients who continue to have symptoms do have an active infection. It's all autoimmune or combination of both. Some identifiers I have seen used are chronic Lyme disease, persistent Lyme, post-Lyme syndrome, post-Lyme disease syndrome, post-treatment Lyme disease, post-treatment Lyme disease, uh, post-treatment Lyme syndrome, and post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. Um, but, you know, I do have to, I'm sorry, I apologize. I have to go back because... For some reason, I didn't see my slide on uh, alpha-gal syndrome, which is extremely important. Give me one second and see if I find it here. Uh, hmm. Okay, well, let me talk a little bit about alpha-gal. I don't know where my slide is, and I apologize. It disappeared somewhere in the... technological sphere of things. Um, okay, so basically what um, alpha-gal is, it's an allergy, and it's an allergy to meat and meat products. And currently they're finding that lone star ticks in the United States um, and possibly other ticks and ticks uh, in the, throughout the world can now transmit this kind of uh, condition. And so what happens if you're bitten by a tick and you suddenly find yourself being allergic to uh, red meat uh, or products that contain red meat? And sometimes, it, you know, it can be things, it's amazing what red meat products can be in. Uh, they, you know, they can be in medications. Um, you know, they may even be in cosmetics. Uh, they may be in a lot of other things. And so the people who develop alpha-gal have to be very careful and they have to ensure um, that they are monitoring, um, you know, their condition because they can go into anaphylaxis. And that's what happens to many of these people before they are diagnosed. Um, and so it is, it is a real problem. And what I will do, I'll make sure that you are provided with that slide to add to this at the end. So what did we go back to the controversy? The IDSA versus ILADS treatment guidelines. This is the controversy. What does this mean? The IDSA is the Infectious Disease Society of America. And ILADS is the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, which I will say I'm a member of, just so you know, as, a, uh, as an advocate, uh, it is a physician society. Um, and so this table talks about the comparing the different conflicting guidelines. And basically the IDSA guidelines have always been and continue to be very stringent. They do not believe, quite frankly, in long-term Lyme. They don't believe there's any evidence to show uh, that uh, long-term Lyme exists, except perhaps in, with Lyme arthritis. They do talk about Lyme arthritis and they do recommend some longer treatments for that. But for the most parts, uh, their treatment um, is only short-term treatment. Um, and they are very disease-oriented. 
with their outcomes, meaning that the disease-oriented outcomes are surrogates for, for the patient-oriented ones. They, re, you know, look at the pathophysiological markers, the laboratory tests, and physical exam findings. Whereas with clinical diagnosis, as you know, patient-oriented outcomes are directly related also to patients' experience of their illness. Uh, the mortality, their morbidity, and their quality of life. And they're looking for things that impact that. And in a clinical diagnosis, a physician, of course, will look at uh, signs and symptoms, and they'll look at lab tests, which are supportive of these clinical manifestations. But they don't necessarily say, if a lab test doesn't show positive, that they will not treat you because we know that these lab tests are not uh, the gold standard lab tests. So longer treatments may be appropriate and persisting infection may be present. No one knows yet what is happening with individuals uh, when they develop long-term symptoms and many do. 20% uh, or more of people can develop long-term symptoms. Now, this is uh, something from my Lyme data patient reg registry. Uh, they uh, provide crucial information about patients with persistent symptoms associated with Lyme disease and their clinical experiences, including their experiences accessing care and treatment and the obstacles they fr frequently face. So over 12,000 patients were enrolled at this time in the registry. So how long until patients were diagnosed with Lyme? Less than four months, 16%. Five to 11 months, 12%. One to two years, 17%. Two to six years, 20%. Six years, 36%. So what the summary, 84% are not diagnosed within the first four months. And everyone knows that an early diagnosis and early treatment is the best way to avoid these long-term symptoms. 72% saw four or more doctors be before diagnosis. 72% are misdiagnosed as psychiatric, uh, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, thyroid, rheumatoid, uh, MS, lupus, learning disabilities, Parkinson's, ALS, etc. So what are these cases of what is called sometimes in the research community post-treatment Lyme disease? Studies have shown that Lyme treatment failure rates may range from 10 to 20 percent. Some studies indicate that more Lyme patients fail treatment than the 10 to 20 percent. Um, but when diagnosed early and giving appropriate treatment, most Lyme disease patients make a full recovery. How up to, however, up to 35 percent of patients experience chronic, often debilitating symptoms. So Lyme and its sequelae are responsible for significant numbers of school and work absences and are estimated to cost more than $1 billion a year for healthcare in the U.S. One estimate of cost shows direct Lyme disease medical costs could represent $1.3 billion each year with marked increases when therapy fails to return patients to pre-Lyme disease health status. And so uh, all of these things, by the way, are documented with peer review uh, at the bottom of the slides. So what persistent and chronic Lyme is supported by scientific research? Well, there's something called persisters and research on persisters uh, showing new antibiotics to eradicate Lyme persisters. New antibiotic protocols, including pulsing, meaning on and off. And two researchers, well, one was at, uh, was at Johns Hopkins, he's not no longer there, but, and Kim Lewis at Northeastern separately investigated persisters and these antibiotics. So what are persisters? Well, they're bacteria cells that can escape effects of antibiotic without genetic change. Uh, 
These cells go dormant when they're treated with antibiotics, yet they can grow again after treatment stops. Unlike resistant cells, which grow in the presence of antibiotics, presence, persisters don't grow in the presence of antibiotics. So that is why the disease could flare up again when treatment stops. So that's one possible answer to some of this. Biofilms. Now, research includes research done by Eva Shappy, University of New Haven, European Journal of Microbiology and Immunology. Biofilms are colonies of bacteria that are encased in slime, and they tend to act as one, and they're highly resistant to antibiotics and host defense. So animal studies have shown with the advent of increasing sensitive PCR analysis, we and others have repeatedly demonstrated in dogs, mice, and rhesus macaque monkeys that non-cultivable spirochetes persist following antibiotic treatment. That was Stephen Barthold, testimony to the House Foreign Affairs Health Subcommittee in 2012, where I also testified. Barthold uh, did a mouse study and antibiotic treatment is unable to clear persisting spirochetes, which remain viable and infectious, but are slowly dividing. Uh, Dr. Phillips and Dr. M Embers in a monkey study, non-cultivable spirochetes persist following antibiotic treatment. Straubinger did famous dog studies. Despite treatment of infected dogs for one month with all these different antibiotics, they continued to be detected as late as 12 months after therapy. Con tissues were consistently culture negative. So how about xenodiagnosis in humans? And this comes from the NIH. Laboratory reared larval uh, deer ticks were placed on 36 subjects. People actually volunteered for this, folks, and allowed to feed to repletion. The ticks were tested for Borrelia burgdorferi. The xenodiagnosis was positive for Borrelia DNA in a patient with an EM early during therapy and in a patient with post-treatment Lyme disease. However, at this time, there's insufficient evidence to conclude that viable spirochetes were present, but they were certainly there. So what about the misuse of the surveillance case definition for Lyme? Everyone knows that the CDC does case definitions for different diseases. And, but they, these, this is a surveillance case definition, not meant for diagnosis and treatment. So over all these decades, this is why patients haven't been able to get diagnosed and treated because pay, uh, physicians were using the CDC criteria. Insurance companies were using it also. The CDC is clear that the surveillance case definitions establish unifying criteria for disease reporting and should not be used as a sole criteria for establishing clinical diagnosis, determining the standard of care necessary for a particular patient, or setting guidelines for quality assurance, or providing standards for reimbursement. Pretty clear, folks. But unfortunately, this is exactly what has been happening. So up until 2022, the Lyme surveillance guidelines by CDC were a 2017 version. And in 2022, they now updated it. And the new uh, definition has it right on there about it's intended for solely for public health surveillance, blah, blah, blah. And the new guidelines have more choices of confirmatory lab evidence because the guidelines are very confusing, very hard to define, but at least they've added some more Lyme tests that they didn't have before. So time will determine if these changes are going to help in the areas of Lyme treatment and diagnosis. Now, what about differential diagnosis? Lyme can mimic, mimic other diseases and conditions. MS, ALS, CFS, FM, rheumatoid, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, lupus, autism, ADD, ADHD, and psychiatric conditions. Doctors need to see if Lyme is causing these symptom clusters and treat for Lyme if condition is caused by this underlying infection. 
So what about Lyme in kids, which I know we're all interested in? So there are Columbia University studies uh, that have been done over time, and one in particular, 2001, children with Lyme had significantly more cognitive and psychiatric disturbances. Cognitive deficits were still found after controlling for anxiety, depression, and fatigue. And Lyme in children may be accompanied by long-term neuropsychiatric disturbances resulting in psychosocial and academic impairments. So regarding depression, parents indicated 41% of children with LD had su su suicidal thoughts. 11% had made a suicide gesture. And in a study we funded early in 1998 out of uh, Columbia, the underdiagnosis in neuropsychiatric Lyme disease in children and adults, it documents an IQ improvement of 22 points in a 16-year-old after IV treatment for Lyme disease. So why do children in school have problems? Well, Lyme can affect all systems of the body. Its signs and symptoms are varied. Often children exhibit problems associated with Lyme, especially behavioral and mood changes that go unrecognized by districts. At times, children may be improperly classified, labeled neurologically impaired or emotionally disturbed, when perhaps a classification including other health impairment might be more appropriate to address the medical problems, triggering the neurologic and or psychiatric problems that stem from Lyme. So children may be identified with attention deficit disorder, medicated for those symptoms, and no other cause is sometimes sought. So why do schools question Lyme? I can speak to this. I spent 12 years on the Board of Education, uh, including board president at times. Uh, so fluctuations in and the variety of symptoms. And these symptoms can fluctuate from minute to minute, folks, with these students. Take my word for it. And Lyme symptoms can vary from day to day, hour to hour. There are very serious sleep disturbances that may cause a child to oversleep in the morning because of difficulty falling asleep at night. And their executive functioning may be impaired. A child may have difficulty organizing their day or life. And recurrent short-term memory, concentration, and recall problems, mental confusion, exhibition of dyslexic type symptoms, interfere with the learning process. Forgetting books and homework assignments, especially in the middle or high school. CDC New Jersey School District's Lyme study. This is something I was involved in because I presented in Congress uh, to, with Congressman Chris Smith from New Jersey to a meeting which he brought in CDC and NIH to for me to discuss what was happening in the schools. And I presented them with my own study of I think six or seven districts in Monmouth and Ocean County and what was happening early, very early on in, in Lyme, which I knew about. My daughter was in school and the cases were all over our district. So they produced a Department of Health study in New Jersey. The CDC came to New Jersey. I helped them try to put this study together of 64 school children with Lyme that showed the median duration of Lyme at the time of interview was 363 days. The median number of days the illness was said to have significantly affected normal activities was 293 days. The mean number of total school days lost was 140. The mean duration of home instruction, 153. Only 26% of children under the study were said to have fully recovered. The direct median cost per case incurred by 54 case patients totaled $5.2 million. I did a CPI adjusted in 2013 for that. That was already up to $8.7 million. I don't know what it is up to, to today. And uh, this is a study quote uh, by a superintendent. Perhaps the greatest costs incurred by the study 
children were the social costs of the illness and its treatment. Schooling and extracurricular learning activities were seriously interrupted for most children. Often children spent large blocks of time as semi-invalids, isolated from social groups and missing out on cultural sports and social activities. School performance of nearly all children fell, sometimes drastically and in several instances was said to interfere with selection by colleges and universities. And so uh, this study was prevent, presented um, and, and uh, referenced uh, in Congressman Smith's Lyme Forum in Wall Township. And uh, anyway, the important point is that there has been a study, it's an older study now, but it showed even early on the problems of uh, what has happened. The CDC did not publish that study, but because it, you know we had presented it publicly in Congressman Smith's forum in Wall Township, uh, we were able to, and the CDC was present, we were able to publish it and we published it in the Lyme Times and you can find that they are the California uh, edition of, of LDA, they're the LymeDisease.org. So that can be found on our website. Student evaluations, to ensure problems are not organically produced by Lyme disease, Districts, parents, and doctors need to carefully evaluate any child with a history of Lyme experiencing neurologic, psychiatric, or AD problems. The bacteria causing the disease can enter the central nervous system less than a day after a tick bite. Additionally, the role of co-infections, diseases transmitted by the same ticks, needs to be examined. Now, these are my suggestions below, based on my years of experience as Board of Education member, a president, child advocate, LDA president, parent of child with Lyme, and Lyme educator and teacher uh, for 39 years. So what I've seen, and I've gone into the schools many times all over New Jersey and other places, children in Lyme experience what I call transitory learning disabilities since they may vary year to year, month to month, even day to day. So possibilities have to be built into an IEP since these conditions change so frequently. A child may require home instruction, special instruction, be in a regular class, classroom, or may be on home instruction and in school part-time at the same time. IEPs often need to contain provisions for instructions over holidays, weekends and the summer because teachable moments are very unpredictable. Sometimes my daughter would be in seizure states when the, the, uh, the, the instructor would turn up at the door and there was no possible way she could have home instruction. And I didn't know for 10 minutes before that that was going to happen. Often students can only take core course subjects because they need to conserve all their strength just to get out of bed and complete those subjects. Many times these young people can't even take a shower for like days at a time. They can't get out of bed. It's, it's, it's totally unbelievable, folks. And I call this the quality versus quantity. And again, at your level, this isn't as important, but I think it's good that you know. Students who have the ability to take honors or advanced placement courses are offered, uh, often discouraged from doing so. I had a district that refused to take uh, a student whose IQ was basically off the charts and put him in honors. And I had to go in and uh, present a lot of things and persuade the district that they were making the wrong decision. And it ends up that that student was ended up teaching the teachers and he certainly did take honors courses. Um, they need to be supported in that choice and permitted to demonstrate a mastery of the curriculum without having to have the extra work. And that can apply at any level. 
because sometimes uh, other students have to do, as you know, uh, a lot of extra work uh, when these students could demonstrate that mastery and they don't have to do it and shouldn't have to do it because quite frankly, their medical condition doesn't allow them to do that. Um, so possible modifications and these, some of these were done before the internet. So there's upgrades that probably need to be done. Oral tests, because oftentimes students cannot read and concentrate and get it, but when they're tested oral, orally they can. Break up instructional periods, extend assignment times, extend test times, testing over several days period. Of course, that generally involves upper level. Tape books and lectures, that's what we used to do, but now, of course, we have the internet. Access textbooks for the blind, same thing. Assignment reinforcement, because a lot of these kids just cannot remember from minute to minute what they were supposed to do uh, or that they were even told. Extra set of books, if possible, one to take, that's usually, again, for upper level. Address sound sensitivity, sensitivity light sensitivity problems may, might need changing seats. Sometimes quality versus quantity, I mentioned that. And this seems self-obvious, uh, let the child go to the nurse. If I were to tell you that there was a case in New Jersey where that didn't happen with a Lyme student. Uh, there were serious consequences to that for the district because they're obviously you can't stop a child that is sick from going to the nurse. Um, and so I just, uh, that's just one of the things that people seem stunned by, but knowing Lyme disease and what's happened, <laughs> I don't think I was too stunned. Shorten school day. Um, and of course, home instruction. So school district policy revisions, um, activities and attendance policies often forbid attendance. These are usually, again, uh, upper levels, though it could be at this one, after, at, during, and absence. But the situation involving, involving a child with a chronic condition like Lyme does not fit into the, any of the existing paradigms. My, my child was out four years and then two partial years, and uh, policy would have forbid her to attend anything, to at least have some contact with her peers. There were times she could have. Um, so absences of months to years often make a student a social outcast and recluse. Homework policies. I don't know about the elementary level, but uh, there's uh, policies that sometimes that require before homework is sent home, there's a length of absence uh, that should not be in for anyone with Lyme because we don't know about the, you know, when the symptoms are going to occur and, uh, you know, the frequency. And sometimes there's short absences of students with Lyme disease. Homework needs to be supplied without any waiting period. This is very important. Again, another Another case in New Jersey, outdoor cl class trip policies and procedures should include information about the dangers of Lyme disease, not only protecting our children, but protecting the staff and the district from unnecessary exposure to the disease and the district from unnecessary expense or litigation. There was a case. So Lyme brochures are available from the LDA website. We have several, the ABCs of Lyme disease. We have our, uh, that is for um, educators and, and uh, Lymer Primer, that has all the different things about Lyme, our tick card. And we'd be happy if your district wanted to uh, have any of those, if they contacted us, we would be glad to provide those uh, resources to them for free. And we also have a book called Lyme Disease is No Fun, Let's Get Well. It was written and edited by two uh, now long adults with Lyme, but were children with Lyme disease. And it's for eight to 12 year old. It was published by the LDA and author Amy Tan wrote the cover note. Um, and there are other resources that you can find uh, on our website. 
Limeade for Kids, that's the program I mentioned. We hope you'll remember that if there's a struggling family. You can find all the details on our website. I'm not going to get into all our legislative efforts. We have been somewhat successful over time. and But I will say the Child Act, which uh, we helped to write and uh, intend to hopefully have it uh, in again this year, to amend the, the IDEA to recognize more clearly Lyme can cause disabilities that affect the education of children and to enhance educational services and related services to children uh, with Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases and for other purposes. And I'm only going to quickly mention uh, the HHS, and I'm trying to see something on my phone here. I'm sorry about what time it is so I see where I'm at. Uh, the HHS working group, we, we got this. Uh, our organization was instrumental along with several others in getting this into law. And we had a six-year working group where uh, a number of us, including myself, I sat on the panel for four years in Washington. And uh, we, uh, we were able to sit with researchers and physicians. Um, and it was in a public setting and make recommendations and reports to Congress. And the, uh, I'm not going to, so the bottom line is, can we escape ticks? Well, here's the deal. Scientists have discovered that a globally distributed seabird tick, which you can see there, Ixodes urii, contains four new arboviruses whose closest relatives are found in our northern hemisphere. They're infesting colonies of king, royal, and rock hopper penguins on the sub Antarctic Macquarie Islands. That's the bottom of the globe, guys. I don't think we ever look at that very often. And in the sub Antarctic Southern Hemisphere, just north of the Antarctic Circle, it contains the Campbell Islands and Isle Crozet. The, and quote, the zoonosis Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi carried by seabirds transmitted by Exodes ticks. It has been found through DNA analysis in ticks on the Campbell Islands and the Island Crozet. King penguins on the Island Crozet have antibodies to Borrelia burgdorferi, and this is in the sub-Antarctic. So this is something found in the Dominican Republic. It's a tick in amber. It's 15 to 45 million years old. Um, and it contains developing stages of something that resembles Babesia. If you remember my discussion on Babesia, the biggest probably co-infection with Lyme. This is an Australian state, snake with ticks from in 2019. This tick was found in a woman's pool with 511 ticks. Now this is our southern border. The USDA actually has cowboys patrolling the Rio Grande for stray livestock and ticks. Uh, livestock with ticks. So the cattle are inspected that they look for. Uh, then they're run through spray boxes, which have a dipping vat charged with something called Colral, which will kill the ticks. So in, as far as prevention, the, uh, this is, a, I love this cartoon. The ticks are especially good today. Those are tick birds that eat ticks off of a rhinoceros. Who protects us? Well, quite frankly, folks, mostly we protect ourselves. Pants and socks, long sleeve shirts, light colored clothing, shoes and socks, hat and tuck in hair, full body tick checks, most important. Remove ticks promptly and properly or risk of infection increases. Put your clothes in the dryer for 35 minutes to kill any ticks if you've been in, in, in tick uh, habitat. There are special tick prevention clothes uh, from rhino skin and insect shield. There are sprays for clothes and sprays for skin. Be informed about them because they're not the same and you don't necessarily want to use uh, some of them on your skin. So current Lyme vaccine trial, they're in the third phase of the Lyme vaccine trial of, of the vaccine uh, from Valneva 
and uh, Pfizer. And uh, we do have concerns about it because there was a former vaccine um, back in the uh, early century. And that vaccine had to be, well, was pulled from the market by the manufacturer. There were a lot of concerns about it. And we don't really have knowledge that the issues brought forth from the last vaccine have been discussed and addressed. And uh, so the manufacturer hasn't reached out to the stakeholders, such as the Lyme communities or the doctors who were involved during that first vaccine for input. And so the Pfizer Valneva Lyme vaccine, uh, they already announced they're going to discontinue a significant portion of their participants. Um, and so it's, it's very prog problematic. They said it will recruit less than the 18,000 planned in their phase three trial trial because they decided by moving to just high endemic areas and taking out sites where we didn't think people would really be at risk of getting Lyme, it meant we could actually considerably reduce the number of participants that we enroll. Um, so I don't know, folks, we're looking for answers and uh, trying to find them. Uh, there is a Modena MRA vaccine under development, that is very similar to the early COVID-based vaccine, MRA, single-stranded MRA, M -M -A, excuse me, MRNA, sorry. Oral vaccine has just come out and been licensed conditionally, uh, and this was... This would be for vaccination of mice against Borrelia burgdorferi or Lyme disease. Um, and the, the mice would get these pellets and uh, it does require a licensed pest management specialist or licensed field biologist. And so uh, you can certainly look into that if you're interested. So getting rid of ticks, this is my favorite tick picture and it's a fungus and uh, it just completely surrounds the tick and it can be used in yards. There's a new acaricide research to kill black-legged ticks. Um, and in the end, I have to love opossums because Rick Osfeld from the Cary Institute in New York said opossums can kill about 5,000 ticks a season. More than 90% of ticks picked up by it are swallowed and killed. So this is my favorite poster from Insectropolis in New Jersey. I love that place. Wanted dead or alive, the AKA, the deer tick, $1,000 reward. Somebody asked me, why would anyone want a deer tick alive? And I said, lots of researchers want them alive. And I thank you very much to Lisa Collins, all who helped to provide the program, Thomas Paine Elementary School, Cherry Hill School District, and the attendees for taking your time to learn about Lyme and tick-borne diseases. Thank you, Pat. That was really a lot of information, but very shocking information too for a lot of people.